glad you all are here. It's good to see you. If you're joining us online, thank you for joining us as well. We're so happy. In fact, we have a number of people who join us online from around our, our town, our city, and our state, even around our country, even some people internationally. I just wonder, could we just welcome them this morning, those who are watching online? Could we just welcome them, make them feel welcome? Glad you're here. Put in the chat where you're watching us from. Glad you're here. Well, today we begin a new chapter, not a new series, but a new chapter. We're in John 12. Can you believe it? We've made it to John 12 so far. And John 12, we're going to see a shift, uh, a real shift in, 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 in really the, what's happening in, in Christ's life. We're going to see a major shift, and we're going to see Jesus beginning to make some bold, drastic statements. Now, he's already made some bold statements, but we're about to see him make some sincerely strong ones. But today with John chapter 12, where we're starting, uh, verses 1 through 7, and I'm going to encourage you to take some notes. We're a church that worships in spirit and in truth. I want you to take these truths, write them down, jump into a small group, and you're going to expound on those. If you're not in a small group, you need to be in one. That's where you're going to build relationships, grow in discipleship, also leadership. Um, but John chapter 12, honestly, the first couple verses kind of get skipped over a lot. And partially because there's so much good stuff happening in John chapter 12. In the latter half of John 12, there's some powerful statements that Jesus is making. Large implications for our life. And so a lot of times people jump through 1 through 7. We know the story. We, we read about Mary who has now spilled this perfume on Jesus' feet and washes his feet with her hair. But there is also something very significant that oftentimes is missed. And it has to do with this guy named Judas. Now, we all know Judas, most likely. Even if you're not familiar with the Christian faith, you've probably heard somebody called a Judas before, and that's not really a compliment. If somebody says, hey, Judas, like, that's not like, that's not like a term of endearment, right? Uh, but here we learn something, not just about Judas, but about us as it pertains to our level of affection towards Christ. And that's really what today is going to be about in large degree. I am going to this morning, and more than me, Scripture is going to be challenging us on, listen now, the strength of our affection towards Christ. Now, I'm not talking about your affection towards Christ. I think many of us would say we have a love for Jesus. We have an affection towards Christ. What Scripture is going to be doing today is it's going to be challenging our uh, our strength or the strength of our affection towards Christ and the alignment of our life that flows from it. The strength of our affection towards Christ and the alignment that flows from it. And we're going to just jump right in because in verse 5, I want you to see what happens here. Verse 5, Jesus is hanging out with Lazarus, Mary, Martha, and then in verse 5 we read this, Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. You have to understand that this culturally was something that was outlandish. This was something reserved for a king. This was not just an act of love. This was not just an act of adoration. This was an act, watch it now, of worship. Of worship. And this is truly one of the first times, there are other times, but not as explicitly, that we see Jesus being worshipped as more than a man, but rather as God. Mary sees this. Now, we know this about Mary. Mary is kind of an emotional individual. And that's okay, right? But it's not okay to some people, as we're just going to see in a moment. But I do think it's funny because Scripture mentions three key characters that are hanging out, having dinner with Jesus. Number one, there's Martha. And just like every, time, every other time Martha is mentioned, what is Martha doing? She's cooking food and she's serving food. What an amazing human being. Amen? I mean, that is what she loves to do. She's busy. Martha is a busybody. She's always, she's very logical. She's very practical. Well, people are going to come to the house. we got to have some food. Well, people are going to want to eat. I better make some biscuits. Well, people are going to want biscuits. I better get the butter. Like, that is how, none of that's in Scripture, by the way. I'm just kind of assuming that. Martha's very busy. She's busy, and she's thoughtful about what is taking place. We also see Lazarus, a key character mentioned here. Interesting post-resurrection, even pre, we don't see Lazarus actually having any type of conversation. And you might be like, wow, is there anything specific or strategic about that? 
I would say this, if you have been raised from the dead, I don't think you have to really say much. <laughs> I just think you have to show up and his life is actually more of a testimony than his word. And I think that's significant. His life, what Jesus has done in him is more significant than anything this man could say. And that was Lazarus's point. He is there. He's lounging. Scripture says he's reclining at the table. I just imagine Lazarus just chilling. People walking by being like, are you that guy? And he's just like, like that's literally what I think Lazarus does. You know it. That's me. I'm Lazarus. I was dead. I'm alive. But then we also see Mary. Mary is not necessarily busy. Mary is not necessarily running around everywhere. Mary is kind of more the emotional type. Mary is maybe a little, uh, she, she's kind of the individual that's going to move on those emotions, maybe make some decisions based on those emotions. She's kind of like in her mind, you can see her saying, well, I've got this a, a very expensive perfume and Jesus is here. Why don't I just pour it all on his feet? Why don't I just dump it all over? And why don't I, I don't have a rag. Don't, what more could I, and she takes her hair and washes her feet washes Jesus' feet, rather. And Scripture mentions this, and it talks about this, which means it's important for us to understand why she does this. And once again, it's more than just an act of love. It is an act of pure worship. And here's a statement that I want you to understand because we see something that takes place here. Let me just read it in verse 5. I'm sorry, verse 7. The reaction from Judas. He says this in verse 5. Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? So here is Martha, busy about serving. Here is Lazarus, just raised from the grave. This is the setup. And here is Mary, washing Jesus' feet. And Judas' reaction, who, by the way, called by Jesus, who, by the way, following after Jesus, who, by the way, knows Jesus, and Jesus knows who he is, and, and Judas's reaction is one of frustration. Mary, tone it down a little bit. Mary, what are you doing? Mary, we could have sold that. Mary, do you know how expensive that stuff is? Like, we could use that. Judas has a point. It's not like every single day the disciples are going through the buffet and having tons of food. Oftentimes they're hungry. It's not like they're staying at the, at, the, at the Four Seasons. Oftentimes they're very tired and, and they don't have a place to rest. Judas is thinking like, man, we could have used that for something else. But here's the point. For our point today, here's what I want you to understand. There will always be voices telling you to tone down your affection towards Jesus. Don't miss this now. There will always be voices telling you to tone down your affection towards Jesus. Always. I remember when I first started learning how to play guitar. And one of my friends had said, dude, you need, if you're going to learn how to play guitar, you need to learn how to play the electric guitar. It's way easier on your hands. It's way more fun, all this kind of stuff. And so, boy, seventh grade me, I had a, a little amp, right? I didn't know anything about anything. I had a guitar that somebody had given to me and I plugged it in and I used to, I didn't have a distortion pedal, but I might as well have because I would crank the gain all the way up. I would crank the treble all the way up. I would crank the bass in the mid halfway up and I would hit those chords and it was so loud. And the only way that I could get it distorted was to turn it all the way up. Anybody in here know what I'm talking about? Anybody in here? Yeah, the only way I could get it to be distorted, to sound like I wanted it to sound, was to turn it up at a, to 11. Literally, that is the only way. And I just, my room next door to my parents, I can remember now, and God bless you, Mom. I love you. I know you watch. But my mom would pound on the wall and just yell, turn it down, right? And I would yell back, is dad home, you know? And she'd be like, no, and I'd be like, okay, and I'd turn it up. That's what literally would happen, right? And she'd yell, turn it down, turn it down. And I remember saying, like, I can't turn it down because it's not going to be what it needs to be. Anybody feel me this morning? I can't tone it down because it's not going to get the sound that I need it to have. As it pertains to our walk with Jesus Christ, specifically our affection and the strength of our affection to, towards Christ, there are always going to be people 
telling you to tone it down. Turn it down. Bring it back just a little bit. This is what Judas was doing to Mary. And it looks like he's doing something, you know, very, very good, really, right? Like he's doing something very specific in terms of like, oh, very practical. Like, well, we could have used that, Mary. You got to think a little bit. That's not what's happening here. That's not what Judas was actually doing. See, what Judas was actually doing was marginalizing Mary's level of affection towards Jesus. Now, don't miss that now. Judas was not just thinking practically. Scripture gives us that understanding. He wasn't just thinking practically. He was thinking even beyond selfishly. We truly get an inside uh, view or peek into the soul of Judas. Because at the end of the day, it wasn't even, as Scripture tells us, it wasn't even about the money for Judas. The deeper issue is this. Don't miss this now. Listen. Judas was giving us an actual insight into who he thought Jesus was and what he thought Jesus was worthy of. See, to Judas, Jesus wasn't worthy of having dumped the most, per most precious perfume on. See, to Judas, Jesus wasn't someone who is worthy of being worshipped. Now, let that get into your heart. Here you see Martha running around serving biscuits. There you see Lazarus reclining at a table. Here you see Mary dumping out perfume and washing the feet of Jesus with her hair. And Judas's reaction to all of this is, turn it down. Tone it down. Mary, what are you doing? This is ridiculous. We could have used that. As it pertains to our lives today, church, there will always be voices telling you to tone it down. Down. See, there's some acceptable things to do as a Christian. You guys realize this, right? Socially acceptable things. It's socially acceptable for you to believe in God. Socially acceptable for you to pray. Socially acceptable for you to show up to church. It's socially acceptable even for you to go on a missions trip. It's even socially acceptable, culturally acceptable for, for you to give some type of finance to your church. Those are all socially acceptable things. But I want you to also understand, there are some uh, areas within the Christian faith that we're being told to turn it down. We're being told, eh, <laughs> why don't you turn that down a little bit? So there's some socially acceptable things. It's okay to do those things. But I want you to know, it's, it's not acceptable to say that you believe in Jesus and that he is the only way to God. Turn that down. Turn, turn that down. It's okay if you believe in God. Turn it down when it comes to Jesus being the only way. Turn that down. Not acceptable. To say you believe that scripture is absolute, an absolute truth. Hey, it's fine if you want to read the Bible. But listen, turn it down. If you're going to tell me that that's the absolute truth, I don't, I don't know. Turn that down. Tone it back. Just bring it back a little bit. You got to tone it down when you talk about heaven and hell. Well, not really heaven. Like, talk about heaven all you want. Heaven's a great place. Everybody's going to be there. It's going to be this. It's going to be that. But mention hell? Tone it down. <laughs> tone it down. Hey, man, we're at work. Can you tone it down a little? Can you, can, you, can you stop? I'll tell you where you stand. Share your faith with somebody. You know, it's interesting. We do live in a free country, right? But begin to share your faith freely. And you will be told to tone it down. Why? Because there will always be voices. There will always be people telling you to back down the level of your affection to Jesus Christ. Bring it back a little bit. Bring it back. You want to go to church? That's good. You want to pray? That's good. You believe in God? That's good. But don't put that on me. Tone it down. And you know what the saddest part of it is? Oftentimes the voices come from inside our own community. We don't want to offend people. We don't want to step on toes. We don't, want to, we don't want to push people away. Can I just be honest with you today? The gospel of Jesus Christ is among the most offensive things in the entire universe. You cannot tone down the gospel. 
You cannot turn down the gospel. You cannot back down the gospel. The gospel is not quiet. The gospel is not soft. The gospel does not tiptoe. The gospel is that there is a God who created all things. Sin broke that. God sent Jesus to die. Why? Because there's nothing good in me. That's offensive. What do you mean there's nothing good in me? There's nothing good in me. There's nothing saving in me. Well, what if I, not good enough. But what if I went, not good enough. But what if I gave, not good enough. There's nothing in and of myself that I can do to save me. I am fully and completely and utterly dependent on the grace of God in sending Jesus to forgive me of my sins and save me from myself. Amen? Scripture says that who can even understand our heart? It is utterly wicked. The depths of my depravity, utterly wicked. I want you to know, church, that is not just offensive, it is growing in its offense in our world today. And so oftentimes there will be voices that say, tone it down, turn it down, bring it back. Now I want you to look at this. Judas was marginalizing Mary's adoration of Jesus. It gives us an inside perspective on Judas. He thought this is a waste because he didn't see Jesus as worthy. That level of adoration, that level of worship. But now watch this in verse 7. <laughs> Jesus' response. Jesus looks at Judas and says, hey, leave her alone. Now, I, I can't really tell you the voice inflection of Christ in this moment, but I could guess. Because Jesus in this moment is being worshipped and adored authentically. And if there's one thing we know about Jesus, it's what? He craves authenticity. He doesn't want the show. He doesn't want the religious pomp and circumstance. What does he want? He wants your heart. He wants the real. He wants the authentic. And here, more than anyone else, Mary is giving him that. Of course, Martha is serving. Nobody has a problem with that. That's how she's demonstrating her affection. Of course, Lazarus is chilling. That's how he's demonstrating quality time. That's how he's demonstrating his affection. But what is Mary doing? Mary is going for it. Mary is like, I don't care who's around. I don't care what this looks like. I don't care what you think of me. I've got to do this. She breaks his perfume. And then this incredible act of intimacy washes the feet of Jesus with her own hair. You ever been in a moment of complete and utter uh, authentic intimacy where you were watching, where you saw something happen? It almost makes you feel a little awkward, doesn't it? You know what I mean? You ever heard somebody open up at a level you're like, I don't know if you should open up that much. You know what I mean? You just bring it back a little bit. I don't know if I don't want to know everything, you know. That's what Mary's doing. Because in her perspective, from her perspective, the only two people in the room are herself and Jesus. She doesn't care who's around. She doesn't care what people think. She just knows I've got to worship this man. I've got to show my affection to the Savior. This is the greatest thing I can do. This is the best thing I can do. And Judas says, stop. And Jesus says, leave her alone. Leave her alone, Judas. Who do you think you are, Judas? You think you can tell somebody to back off their affection towards me? You think you can tell somebody to not authentically worship me? Strong words from Jesus Christ. Now, I would say, I got to give props, like I said, to Martha, to Lazarus, to Mary, because the fact of the matter is, when it comes to affection, we all have different ways of demonstrating our affection. If you're married, you understand this. If you're dating, you also understand this. If you have children, you understand this even at a deeper level. And as it pertains to affection, there are many different types of affection, different levels of affection that we have for different people and different things, and we demonstrate them in different ways, right? Maybe you've heard of the different love languages. You have acts of service. Maybe that's how you demonstrate affection, or maybe that's how you receive affection, right? 
Maybe it's quality time, just spending time with somebody is how you receive or, or give affection. Maybe it's gifts, right? Maybe it's words of affirmation. Maybe it's physical touch. But whatever it is, I want to challenge you today. Whatever your love language is, however you push out love, however you receive love, do not tone it down as it pertains to Jesus. Do not tone it down as it pertains to Christ. And do not allow other people to tell you to back down in your love of Christ. I'm going to be honest with you. If you are up in the front row and you can't help it because when worship starts, you're sticking your hands up. You're yelling as loud as you can. And you're bopping around because for you, you just can't help yourself. Don't you dare, Christian brother. Don't you dare, Christian sister, be somebody who looks up, looks up and says, man, well, that guy's a little nuts up there. Don't you dare do that. If you're somebody who says, man, I just love to help. Like, what can I do to serve? What can I do to give? What does the church need? What does our community do? What, what, I will do anything. Call me at 2 a.m. I will be there. Don't, don't be somebody who says, man, back off a little bit. If you're somebody who wants to just speak life into other people, and, and, and man, your thing is words of affirmation. You want to encourage and counsel and help and pray. There will be people, listen to me now, there will be people who tell you to tone it down, take it easy, back it off, don't go so hard into this thing. You're going to offend people, you're going to burn people out, but Jesus would say, come, I want your authentic worship of me. I want to ask you today, how is the strength in your love for Christ? What level of, of love do you have for Jesus? And I ask that way because it's this. The level of affection that you have will determine the type of life you lead. What do I mean by that? Your affection for Christ should align your priorities. In other words, everything you do should flow from your affection from Christ. But what do we see? We don't see that. We don't see that in our culture. See, at the point where you begin making very real life decisions around your relationship with Jesus, people start telling you you're in too deep. When you start, listen to me, teenager, when you start saying like, man, I want to play, but I can't do that because I can't miss my time with Christ. Well, that went hard. That's a very real situation. People are like, man, you just back off a little bit. Just back off a little bit. When your boss says, listen, I'm going to need you to do this and this, and you're like, I, I can't. I can't do that in terms of my integrity. I can't say that. I'm a follower of Jesus. Don't ask me to, you can't ask me to, well, we're not really, and we kind of explain it away. Well, we're not really saying this. We're actually saying this. No, I can't do that. My level of affection towards Christ keeps me from saying those things, keeps me from doing those things. When you as a parent make drastic decisions in your children's life because you want them to grow up and be like Jesus Christ, people will tell you, back off. Back down, tone it down, turn it down. And I want to encourage you today, as your brother in Christ, do not turn down your affection for Jesus. Do not tone down your affection towards Jesus as it pertains to you men. Be careful what you see. Be careful where you go. Be careful what you do. Don't turn it down. As it pertains to you women, be careful what you see. Be careful what you do. Be careful what you go. Do not turn down your affection towards Christ. Listen, parents, instill that in your children. You will be backwards in culture. Society will say, no, it's okay to give them this. It's okay to have them do this. It's okay for them to watch this. It's okay to have the, the iPad nanny your children. It's okay. Everybody else does it. Not a problem here. I can't do those things. I know it's not what culture says. I know it's not what society does. But based on my strength, the affection that I have for Christ, I'm going to live differently. I got to be different. And in a culture, even oftentimes a Christian culture that says, no, it's fine, just don't go so hard. I'm letting you know Christ is after authentic relationship with you. Christ is not asking you to turn it down. He's asking you to turn it up. Turn it up. Turn up your level of affection to Christ. And why should we not? Why should we not? Has anyone else loved you as Christ loves you? Has anyone else died for you as Christ has died for you? Has anyone else come and given you access to God the Father? Has anyone else offered you the forgiveness that Jesus died and rose again to give? No! No! 
If our God demands our authentic affection, then we should give it to him regardless of what it costs us, regardless of what it demands, regardless of the life shift and change that it, that it makes in my life. I love this passage. And I'll close with this because if not, I'm scared I'll lose my voice. Romans chapter 1. I... I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I am not ashamed. And listen to me, church, and still, until we get to a place as men and women, children, where we start standing up and saying, I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed of what I believe. I'm not ashamed that I believe in Jesus Christ. I'm not ashamed that I believe in the, in, the, in the integrity of Scripture. I'm not ashamed of what it says. I'm not ashamed that I'm going to live my life differently. I'm not ashamed that I can't go there with you. I'm not ashamed that I can't speak that way. I'm not ashamed that I can't drink that. I'm not ashamed that I can't smoke that. I'm not ashamed that I can't do the same thing that you're doing or that I used to do because I'm not ashamed of the gospel and I can't back off that. And that's offensive. That's what Jesus calls us to be. Now we can present it in a loving way, of course, and we should. But at the core of it, I gotta ask you, are you a Mary or are you a Judas? Do you have the heart of Mary that says whatever, whenever, wherever, I don't care, I just gotta get to the feet of Jesus? Or are you a Judas? who says, we could have done this differently. We don't have to go that far. We could have turned it down. We could have tuned it down, toned it down. Would you just bow your heads? Close your eyes for a moment. Allow the Spirit to begin working, convicting. For some of us right now, we're feeling an immense amount of conviction. For others of us, we are feeling an immense amount of motivation. For others of us, we're wondering if we got this thing right. But I want you to know the common factor, the center, the linchpin of all of that is the gospel. Is the fact that Jesus loves you, that he died for you. If you call out to him, he will save you and forgive you. And no matter how far you've gone, you can't outrun Christ. No matter what you've done, you can't earn less, more of his love. He gives it freely, and that means you. I don't know your circumstance, your situation, what you did yesterday or even this morning, but I can tell you nothing you've done could ever change the love of Jesus Christ for you. Nothing. And it's never too late to turn it all the way up for Jesus. Eyes closed, heads bowed. Spend a moment thinking about the strength of your affection towards Jesus Christ.